The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on China Africa relations through training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Podcast Network. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by China Global South's managing editor, Kobus van Staden, who is still in beautiful Cape Town, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. And I'm in Cape Town and I'm working from a co-working space today. So I might sound a little bit different. There might be a bit of background noise. So apologies for that. No worries. We've had our adventures in co-working spaces over the past few weeks while I was in Europe. Also, you have them there in Cape Town. We forgive you for that. So no problem. But anyway, it's been in Africa an extraordinarily busy week for U.S. and Chinese diplomacy and infrastructure development. So all week, what we've been watching is two U.S. cabinet secretaries are Now on the continent, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen arrived last week, and then later this week, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Linda Thomas-Greenfield, she too also arrived. That has put the China-Africa relationship front and center in a lot of the discourse at the same time. There was so much going on, as I mentioned, in the infrastructure space, and I'm going to walk you through a number of these different events because they really showcase the contrast and styles between these two countries in Africa and what they're doing. And that's what we're going to deep dive on today. Let's first start on Monday up in Lagos State where the port of Lekki, this is the deep sea water port of Lekki in Lagos State in the free trade zone. This is a $1.5 billion port, is now the largest deep sea port in West Africa. It's also the most advanced. Interestingly enough, it's a joint venture among Singaporeans, Chinese, French, and Nigerians. So very, very interesting. What's also very important about this, and for many years now, I've been calling this China's most important infrastructure experiment in Africa because the China Harbor Engineering Company took a $221 million equity stake. So this is not financed through a loan. And those loans have caused so many problems in recent years. This is an equity stake. So they own a part of the port. Let's listen in now to some of the comments from Lagos State Governor Babajide Samuolu, who was among a number of dignitaries on hand to join President Muhammadu Buhari to commission the new Lekki Deepwater Port in Lagos on Monday. And so, Mr. President, you can see that it's been a total combination of um, federal government, Lagos State, and the private sector. And we're happy that this is happening in your time because it all started within your time and it's been completed within your time as well. We're indeed excited that um, the size of the vessels that will be coming in here um, could be up to four times um, the size of vessels that are currently built at both Tinkan and Apapa Port. So it's a big, big, massive infrastructure. And we're indeed excited that in your own time, um, something fresh has been birthed into this country. It's going to generate thousands and thousands of jobs directly and thousands, hundreds of thousands of jobs indirectly in the entire ecosystem. And so this is your project, and we're excited um, with all of our partners, um, the Chinese ambassador, the French ambassador, the Singaporeans, and our various agencies and, and regulators have worked tirelessly to bring about the completion of the, and of course, to thank the locals, the citizens and the residents in the Bejuleki for being um, um, forward-looking and understanding that this is real investment that has come to their corridor. Your Excellency, we want to thank you again. Thank you, sir. So he was referring to Mohamedou Bahari's tenure there. He is exiting office, and so he's got a number of these showcase projects of, that he's going to. The next day, uh, also in Lagos, the president went down to commission the 27-kilometer Blue Line Light Railway that opened and became fully operational. And when it's up and running, which will probably be next couple days, they're going to really start ramping it up. They're forecasting that this new light rail is going to carry 7.5 million Lagosians every month. And for this one, let's take a listen to some of the comments from Chinese ambassador to Nigeria, Tsui Jian Chun. I'm very happy and honored, privileged to have this great opportunity to witness the official commissioning of broad lines. I want to share my feeling and observation 
blue line is speed line of time. I know that one and two two hours could be shortened in fifteen to twenty minutes. I also want to let you know, Lagos is a great city, great economic center, has great mass. So great mass times speed, we could have more energy. This is the relativity of Einstein. And also, I want to let you know, time is money. In the year early 1980s, we have a special economic zone in Shenzhen. At that time, the slogan is "Time is money, efficiency is life." So today, really, we find Lagos. We really understand what's meaning of time. Kobus, it is so interesting to hear. The divergence in how the Chinese talk about these infrastructure projects, and how we hear the U.S. and Europeans and others. Let's continue down our list here. Again, this is all in one week. In Uganda, President Yoweri Museveni he commissioned the first of four planned oil rigs at the Kingfisher site located on Lake Albert. Now, this is a project that's being done in partnership with the Chinese state-owned oil major Sinook, and it's part of the very, very controversial. East African crude oil pipeline that environmentalists have said is a disaster, and they, they've tried to stop it. This is a again France being involved here with China. So we have a Franco-Chinese project in Nigeria, the Lekki port, and a Franco-Chinese project in Uganda. So it's very interesting again to see the dynamics behind this when it gets fully operational and they're starting to pull oil out of the ground. Somewhere around 2025, the Ugandans are hoping to be able to generate somewhere around 230,000 barrels a day of oil, making Uganda Africa's newest oil-producing country. Here are some remarks from Chinese Ambassador Zhang Lijong. It's an important milestone in the development of Uganda's oil industry, and will definitely have far-reaching impacts on the socio-economic transformation. Uganda. Now, Kobus, all of this is happening, as I mentioned at the top of the program, in the backdrop of U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen on the continent, and now U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Linda Thomas Greenfield. Both of them have said repeatedly, and these are two outspoken critics of the Chinese, not only in Africa but elsewhere in the global South, that they want the United States to be the preferred partner. For African governments, and and this prompted a debate in the United States that I'd like to give you a little taste of, and it was a fascinating discussion on CBS News, which is one of the American television networks. Anchor Vladimir Duterte, and he was speaking with Amaka Anku, who is the director of the Africa program at the Eurasia Group in Washington. And Kobus, I want to get your take on their exchange because. Again, consider all of these infrastructure programs that the Chinese have launched just this week in the context of the U.S.-Africa relationship. When I was based in Africa, in West Africa, in Nigeria,、um, there there was a sense that look,、uh, the United States, in addition to offering economic support, is offering is also offering a path forward when it comes to democracy and human rights and freedom of the press. But In the last six years in this country, those things、mm. have been stress tests, as you are well aware. And everyone around the world is watching what is happening here and saying, you know, maybe you're not the ones to lecture us about the way we should run our country, but we welcome economic support and development、um, without any strings attached as to how we should do things.、Um, mm. That、I、seems、think. to be the way that China has has in, in the past progressed、um, with their relationships on the continent. Do you see、I、it the same say, way? Yes, I would say that the focus in the past from U.S. officials had been a bit too too much on the rights language,、mm. on the democracy, on the folk, right? Because we're now in a in a in a reality in a world where most African countries this is these principles are well ingrained. Right, there's no ideological threat. Nobody wants to live in a China-like society, right? So. The U.S. can move beyond that, and so the focus has been a bit too much on the rights and democracy, and they are trying to pivot. In my view, I think this is still a work in progress to pivot to more concrete deliverables. Over the past 30 years or so, 20 years or so, China is the country that has been there to finance those African priorities: building bridges, you know, building rail, 
laying fiber optic cables. And those are the kinds of things that African countries now want to see the U.S. focus more on and put its money behind its rhetoric as well. Well, there you go, Kobus. This was on full display this week. That is what African stakeholders are telling the Americans. Let me stop there and get your take. Help us understand all of this and bring it together. Well, I think what we have here is very different takes on what development means. And as we see, as we hear American stakeholders kind of calling more and more for the US to be a bigger stakeholder for Africa, I mean, being a bigger stakeholder for Africa, you know, the Chinese are providing (laughs) an example of what that could look like, right? Kind of like none none of that is perfect. There's a lot of problems. I'm writing for our column tomorrow for actually for our newsletter about massive corruption in relation to a Chinese state-owned enterprise providing rail, you know, kind of, you know, uh, locomotives and so on. In, in South Africa. So it's very far from perfect. You know, kind of in, in the, the Lekki port is such a massive game changer, you know, in relation to not only to Nigeria, but to Atlantic economies as a whole, you know, kind of that port is really going to change things. And so that is what that kind of partnership could look like. And that is what the Africans want. I mean, whether the American side has the appetite or the money or the energy for that is a different question. But, you know, on the African side, I think the, the vision is pretty clear. Well, let's get a perspective from somebody who's got a front row seat to all of this sitting in Washington, D.C. Ken Opalo is an assistant professor in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. Ken, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule today to join us. We're just so thrilled to have you on the show and to be able to share some of your insights both on the U.S. and what the Chinese are doing in Africa. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Kobus, for having me. I'm a huge fan of the podcast and the work that you do and uh, looking forward to a conversation today. Wonderful. Well, that's very kind of you. Before we talk about your assessment of China-Africa relations, and you wrote an excellent column on that that I'd like to get to, I want to first ask you about U.S. policy. And last month in a column for Kenya Standard newspaper, you wrote that it's time, and I'm going to quote here, for a reset of Africa and America relations. Based on what you've seen this week with Janet Yellen and Linda Thomas-Greenfield, and also what you saw at last month's U.S.-Africa summit— How do you think they're doing in terms of resetting this relationship? I think that, for one, the optics has changed a little bit, right? And a common metric I like to use is to contrast, say, social media outputs from Chinese embassies and missions in Africa compared to the U.S., right? So if you look at the Chinese officials, they're often doing what you described at the beginning of the show, uh, launching projects. Uh, very much focus on economic diplomacy. U.S. officials, on the other hand, typically are meeting, you know, opposition politicians, talking what a marker refers to as sort of governance and rights language, right? And so I think one of the key differences in the summit, in my view, was just the emphasis on commercial relations above and beyond sort of the standard rights language that has dominated U.S.-Africa policy uh, over the last 30 years. That is rights and humanitarian assistance as opposed to a focus on commercial relations. So I count that as progress in the right direction. I'm still not ready to give it a grade yet, given that implementation will be key. We'll see how much of the about $50 billion in commitments, many of which are recycled, really uh, money, actually get implemented uh, and where they'll be focused. I'm still TBD on that. So in your Substack newsletter, you argue that there's a fundamental issue involved in U.S. development assistance to Africa or development cooperation with Africa in that it's very much biased towards American companies and also quite rigid, frequently like not allowing, implementing offices on the ground a lot of leeway or, you know, to maneuver in order to improve projects. I wonder if you could unpack that a little bit. Like what is the state of U.S. development assistance to Africa particularly? I think the U.S. does a lot on the continent, much of it through USAID, and that comes in the form of project assistance. Now, the problem with U.S. assistance is that the U.S. helps others by spending lots of money on itself. So if USAID is doing a project in Malawi, a lot of that money actually stays in the U.S. in the form of paying for Americans' time and American expertise. So that actual project implementation only gets you know, a fraction of the actual dollar amount allocated. Now, there are differences here, important differences here between the U.S. and China, because, you know, China is always looming in the back of our minds when you think about the U.S. So when China is building a port in Lekki, right, it's true that a lot of the money also stays in China in the form of Chinese financing to a Chinese company doing a project in Nigeria. 
However, you know, there's a port to be seen at the end of everything. Well, in the U.S., because a lot of the money on projects gets spent on soft sort of human capital expertise, right? Most of that money stays in the Beltway here around D.C., instead of actually making impact on the ground. And so American assistance ends up being not readily visible because of the specific sectors that America focuses on. So if it's food relief, you know, it has to be American grain on American shipping companies, adding costs, not really helping farmers in the destination regions, right? If it's democracy promotion, again, American expertise with lots of safeguards against, you know, suspected corruption, thereby also limiting the amount of money getting to the ground to impact programming on the ground. So I think that's one of the main challenges that the U.S. has uh, in terms of the setup of how it assists African countries. I would prefer a situation whereby there's more sort of willingness to do brick and mortar sorts of exchanges that actually improve the material conditions in African countries, as opposed to the current dominance of tide aid as the main form of assistance. Well, that's what makes me suspicious that the United States is ultimately going to be effective to respond to the calls that Amaka was pointing out, that African stakeholders are telling Americans that they don't want to hear about rights, they want to see tangible actions on the ground. And again, in Africa, the demand is for infrastructure. And Washington is known for a lot of things, but giving up money is not one of them. And so if you're talking about freeing up money out of the beltway, out of the beltway bandits, if you will, and allowing more of that money to flow into Africa, it seems not feasible, right? I mean, that just doesn't, that's not how Washington works. This is a, an underappreciated constraint on sort of the political economy of America's assistance to other countries in Africa and in other regions as well, right? The fact that the contractor model is one whereby America is mostly spending money on Americans. And the... Congress is complicit here because the United States Congress puts a lot of constraints on who can get American money, how it can be spent, which often makes it such that only Americans can qualify as contractors to get U.S. money. Now, Samantha Power is trying to shift that a little bit at USAID to increase it to more than 25%. But I think 25% of the money going to sort of non-U.S. local organizations and, you know, my response to that is that, you know, it's 2023. It's really hard for me to imagine why a country like Kenya, Nigeria, Ghana, Senegal would only have access to 25% of American money. You know, I can think of dozens of organizations that have the capacity and the knowledge to spend American money well in ways that would enhance U.S. foreign policy objectives much better than the current model. So I think, you know, even what's being touted now as sort of progress is still, you know, way below expectations. Okay, well, let's shift our conversation to China, Africa. As Kobus mentioned in your Africanist Perspective newsletter on Substack, which I recommend everybody sign up to, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes. You wrote a lengthy column at the beginning of the year entitled The Future of Sino-Africa Relations. I'd like to read a section of that just to kind of set the stage for what we're going to talk about today. There is no question, you write, that over the last two decades, Chinese financed and built roads, power lines, dams, and other infrastructure have unambiguously improved livelihoods in Africa, despite all the corruption and questions about quality. Yet all that investment can easily be swept down the drain by the consequences of short-termism on the part of both Africans and Chinese officials. Can you expand on that? Yeah, so if anyone who traveled in Africa before the early 2000s, right, whether in cities or in rural areas, there were barely any serviceable roads. And then something happened with China's rise, and there was this massive construction boom everywhere, which in many ways unlocked Africa's economies, right? If you just think of land prices along the roads built in the region and sort of the knock-on effects that uh, those investments then had on real estate and other sectors of the economy. I think China has been a net benefit for Africa as a trading partner and as sort of a catalyst for development in the region. At the same time, however, I think China runs the risk of not reaping the benefit of its sort of realistic approach to Africa's development challenges. And this comes in the form of, you know, loans that are not well thought out, too much permissiveness to sort of the kinds of corruption that don't just facilitate projects, but actually can 
uh, kneecap entire projects, right? So it's one thing to allow 5%, 10% cost of doing business types of corruption, if you will. It's quite another if entire projects, you know, billion dollar projects or hundreds of millions of dollars in projects are set up simply for corruption purposes instead of being designed to actually deliver on specific economic goals. Because the latter types of projects then end up saddling economies with debt and thereby beginning to threaten countries' macroeconomic stability. And so China's pitch, which I'm still bullish on, is one of development, right? Economic growth and development and global integration of the country's regions, of the continent's regions. And so if that's the pitch, then the follow-up should be to make sure that all investments are as efficient as it can get. Of course, paying attention to local political economies. So, you know, I'm not one to sort of advocate for, say, a World Bank model where projects take 20 years to get off the ground because, you know, every box has to be checked. I wouldn't want to go that far. But at the same time, you know, I would wish that China would see the need to be a little bit more economical in terms of what's permissible and what's not in order to make sure that the projects themselves and their success serve as sort of adverts for what Chinese cooperation can do for African economies. You know, over the last few years, as there's been more scrutiny on some of the more controversial China-Africa deals, and particularly the standard gauge railway in Kenya and some of the extremely corrupt deals in South Africa, there's been the emergence of... I think, more insight into the kind of level of distance between the Chinese government or Chinese bureaucrats and Chinese companies and the role Chinese companies frequently play in padding some of these contracts. So I was wondering, you know, kind of like on on the one hand, the flexibility allowed by something that we see in something like the Belt and Road Initiative, where the Chinese government sets a kind of a general policy direction, and then all of these different Chinese actors, particularly Chinese companies, then also jump into formation, but in their own way, following their own agendas. That has been quite productive, actually, you know, kind of in um, that, that level of flexibility between the two has been quite productive in producing, in fueling new kind of infrastructure building in Africa. But as I mentioned, there's also a lot of problems. So I was wondering, you know, kind of what what your thinking is around that gap and what can be done to improve that? Yeah, I think, you know, I feel China could do a few practical things, which is help the African side in terms of capacity building for project design, evaluation, feasibility studies, etc. Because, you know, if you look at some of the more egregious scandals, including Kenya's SGR, right, it was the same company that did the design, did the feasibility study and then implementation right, that eliminates any potential checks in the process. So if African countries have enough capacity, or if China can set up its own independent capacity on just China side of things to make sure that there's a sanity check at some point during the project development phase to make sure that at a minimum, right, while allowing for the cost of doing business, uh, types of corruption, if you will, while allowing, you know, understanding that different countries have different political economies, and that China should not try or be in the business of trying to fix that. It's important to also make sure that there are checks that guarantee projects' commercial success, right? Because that's what gets the impact, right? Economically non-viable projects are bad PR for Beijing, if you will. It seems like the SGR is really a case study in what not to do uh, for Chinese-funded projects. You call it a white elephant, and you say, this thing was a mess. But in many ways, I think the Chinese have also learned from this. I think they're out of the business of funding these multi-billion dollar infrastructure projects that will take 50 to 100 years to repay. And let's not forget the German railway system, the French railway system, the UK railway system, and Amtrak itself do not run at a profit, and they need subsidies. So there's nothing exceptional about a railway losing money. But as you pointed out, the way that this one was done, it was just FUBAR from top to bottom. And we're seeing how the Ugandans and the Tanzanians now seem to be learning from this process, spreading out the construction contracts, getting financing from different places, reducing the cost of the financing. What do you think is the most important takeaway from the SGR experience that you would advise other African governments who are considering large-scale infrastructure loans and involvement of the Chinese? Yeah, I think number one would be for African governments to ensure that before any major commitments, you know, there are independent checks 
on project design and feasibility studies, especially commercial feasibility studies, right? And I think the capacity can be built locally or regionally. So you could imagine an outfit that the East African community sets up whose role would be to independently evaluate specific projects, right? And this can be done on a confidential basis with governments in order not to release any commercial secrets to the public. Sort of just a practical approach to dealing with this problem, right? As much as, you know, I've criticized the SGR, right, I fully appreciate the point that countries learn by doing, and it's this probably was unavoidable, uh, learning from this incredible access to lots and lots of financing that came with China's rise. So maybe some of these mistakes were unavoidable, but now that they've happened, right, I think the number one thing that I think African government should focus on is beefing up capacity on their side to guarantee that even when they're saddling projects with their own sort of political and cronies demands, right, that those processes do not ultimately kill the commercial viability of projects. And I say this knowing that, you know, uh, zero corruption is an ideal goal, but which no country can ever attain, right? Um, Here I'm thinking of the Californian uh, high-speed rail system, which is now, you know, tens of billions of dollars of a budget. So you can't avoid that in sort of a public sector project. However, you can do better, especially if you're a low-income country with very small margins, to make sure that even after doing that, projects ultimately are successful. Because as Kobus put it, right, Beijing sets broad-based goals. Chinese companies are competing with each other to get the attention and contracts from African governments. It's upon African governments, therefore, to be able to discern which projects are commercially viable and which ones are not. Because expecting benevolence from the Chinese side would not pay off since China will not be scrutinizing each and every project in the region. However, you know, as I said in the Substack post, right, I'd still like a bit more sort of scrutiny on the Beijing side as well, right? So that as part of this broad-based goal setting, sort of putting limits on commercial viability as, as a red line that ought not be crossed, even as the companies are competing in their own sort of non-market, stra- using their own different non-market strategies. So, you know, in, in relation to that, to, to the issue of that kind of oversight, where do you think that oversight should be located, kind of on the, on the Beijing side? Like, you know, over, over the last few years, we've seen more and more kind of guidelines coming out of Beijing around kind of, for example, ESG implementation around kind of like environmentally sustainable projects and so on. There's, there's, there's much more specific language and specific guidelines for Chinese companies being put out by the Chinese government. Do you think that those should start coming with more teeth like you know more more kind of you know more enforcement kind of from from the chinese side or is there a way of where simply increasing transparency would do the job so yeah i mean here i'm being cognizant that you know different african countries have different sort of political systems right so i think china could leverage transparency in contexts where political institutions can use that newfound transparency well right so in a place where, like Kenya, South Africa, Ghana, right, Senegal, where a parliamentary approval process can actually reasonably get enough safeguards into contract design, then, yeah, China ought to le- be able to lean on domestic institutions to sort of shine some light on projects before they get off the drawing board. In other countries that are more autocratic, more closed, that will not be possible since, you know, presidents would still get their way anyway. So in those places, right, perhaps safeguards could come from the China side. Now, I say all this without, you know, wanting to fall into the trap of thinking that I think most people outside of China often imagine that the government in China is this omnipotent force that always gets what it wants, right? But China also has its own domestic politics and Beijing has to pay attention to those and associated interest groups. So I think I would imagine that the MFA, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, could set specific guidelines along the lines of ESG, as you mentioned, that, you know, these are some of the goals for commercial viability that every project must check. But then also pay more attention, and this is a point that I also made in the Substack, right? Beijing should invest more in understanding African politics instead of, you know, whatever we saw, which is just assume that everyone everywhere has a price. And that at the end of the day, that's all that matters for projects, right? It's it, knowing more about African politics would allow it to have a bit more of a variegated approach in how it it, it works in different countries, leveraging political institutions, democratic political institutions in some contexts, and perhaps relying more on top-down sort of regulation and oversight in other contexts. 
But that's really a two-way street in many respects, too, because African stakeholders also have an obligation to become more sophisticated about China. And one of the things that we've noticed in the 13, 14 years that we've been covering this is that African knowledge about China and China literacy overall has not improved as much as one would think, given the levels of engagement. So it seems like that goes both ways. Absolutely, right? Absolutely. And I think it's time for African governments to be a little bit more proactive in their foreign policy engagements, right? Because I'm often struck by how most, you know, just naively assume that projects will come their way and that the projects that the companies pitching the projects will have thought all the details through, right? And so I think one of the problems in the SGR is that there was a bit of a miscommunication in thinking because on the China side, I think there's an assumption that oh, surely the Kenyans have a plan. And I think on the Kenya side, right, there's also an assumption that surely, you know, even if we the railway line is saddled with overage in costs that it has, China would still finance the line through into Uganda and Rwanda to make it commercially viable. And so to avoid such miscommunications and failures, there's definitely a need for African governments to invest in themselves in, in order to be able to better understand China so that, you know, they create better opportunities for Chinese farms to plug and play in sectors such as infrastructure development. In a recent article in your Substack, you took a, a kind of a wide view of the Africa-China relationship and you, you made four recommendations that to improve the outcomes from all of this, particularly infrastructure and big project kind of cooperation. And one of them was you called for an externalization of Chinese bureaucratic competence to Africa. And, you know, we know that over the last few years there's been increasing alarm in Washington, D.C. around this idea that China wants to export Chinese systems to the rest of the world and export Chinese standards to the rest of the world. And I can I can imagine that, you know, that that, you know, recommendation to it to externalize Chinese bureaucratic competence to Africa would cause, you know, shrieking up and down the beltway. So I was wondering, like, how you frame that, how you thought about that and, and what that would look like. Yeah. So, I mean, I think what makes China successful and what has made China successful over the last sort of 40, 50 years has been the state's capacity to get stuff done, right? It's the secret to effective governance and effective development, right? And I see that process, right? The process of getting uh, administrative and bureaucratic capacity to a point where it can deliver well as being related to but separate from the process of democratization and the associated accountability mechanisms, right? So, The image I have here is of a tractor and a driver of the tractor, right? Democracy ensures that we can hire and fire the person driving the tractor. Administrative and bureaucratic capacity development ensures that we have a functioning tractor that's well-fueled and well-maintained all the time. So if all you get is support to be able to hire and fire very good drivers and you have a dysfunctional tractor, you know, you might as well not have a tractor, right? And the driver therefore becomes useless. And so the way I see it is that Africa sorely needs investments in tractors that can get stuff done. And the problem, of course, is that the Beltway and I think most Westerners in general still have this sort of view that democracy can somehow get us to having a functional tractor. And, you know, I just don't buy that the theory of change that often comes with thinking that, you know, if you get to the sort of democratization kingdom, everything else will follow. We need to invest, consciously invest on both. They're related, but they will run on parallel tracks. And so China, I think, has lots of lessons to share with lower income countries that are trying to develop at this point in global history lessons that it's much better place to provide than, uh, say, a Denmark, right? Because often what you see is Western governments will simply say, you know, be like us, right? That's not a good piece of advice. China, on the other hand, knows how to get there. And I think China can share effective forms of governance without, you know, that are agnostic to political systems. Because I think Government effectiveness works well under democracy or autocracy or whatever system of government one has. And so to the extent that China can share administrative practices, train bureaucrats, right, just, you know, enable systems that strengthen state capacity, it will go a long way in helping African governments move the needle in terms of their developmentalist agendas. And, you know, the last point on this is that I don't think, say, the U.S. can do this well, because as I note in the Substack post, most Americans growing up in systems with, in a system with a strong government, right, are very skeptical of government. And so reform for Americans is constraining government, right? 
But what happens when there's no government to constrain? When I look at the Central African Republic, there's no government to constrain. So the first order of business should be to build a government, right? And if the only tool we have in our, in our toolbox is government constraints, then we're not really going to be helping the Central African Republic in the interim. Ken, just as I've been listening to you, I've been thinking back to a few years ago when I was uh, invited and I had the, the honor to do a guest lecture at the School of Foreign Service where you teach. And this was right before the pandemic. And what blew me away was how the students at Georgetown in so many ways parroted the norms and the narratives in greater Washington. So anything China did was bad, 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 bad. There was no defense of it. You know, there was no nuance, no subtlety. China sucks. That's it. <laughs> that was the end of the, the of, and it was just, there was no discussion about it. And here I am listening to your contrarian views, uh, your nuanced approach to it all. And I'm wondering what kind of reaction with your students and your colleagues in Georgetown do you get for some of these perspectives? I think there's definitely sort of uh, a lot of like China bashing that's in vogue these days in D.C. At the same time, you know, privately people will grumble, right? When escalators in D.C. don't work out in the train stations, everyone remembers that, you know, China would fix that in half an hour, right? And so there's both China bashing, but also China envy with regard to Chinese effectiveness. So I, I think most of the time, you know, what I try to do uh, with our students who, I must say, you know, are very reasonable in this regard is to try and help people understand, say, why a Kenyan politician who's in the business of trying to win elections right, would go for a loan from China in order to build a school or a well or a water system, right, or a new road, right. And through that process, demystify this whole sort of China scare that you find in the Beltway. And also to just ask the question, you know, what African country is not a democracy today because of China, right? It's hard to think of one, right? All these countries' political developments have followed their unique trajectories informed by their history, and so whenever the governor's question comes up, I'm always like, you know, China will be as successful in exporting its brand of autocracy as Western governments have been successful in exporting their brands of democracy, right, which is not successful. And so at the end of the day, we should pay attention to the real issues in the real world. Ken, you are doing God's work, given the fact that the School of Foreign Service is a finishing school for a number of U.S. government officials who will enter into the Foreign Service and desperately need that nuance and subtlety that you're bringing to the discussion. I'm certainly hoping the next time I'm on campus at Georgetown, I'll be able to hear that same kind of enthusiasm from your students. Uh, the article is The Future of Sino-Africa Relations. It's a must read. It's on Ken's Substack newsletter, which I mentioned is absolutely indispensable. You can sign up again through the link in the show notes. Uh, an Africanist Perspective is the name of the newsletter. Ken Opalo is an assistant professor in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. Ken, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us. If people want to follow the work that you're doing and what you're reading and writing, what's the best way for them to stay in touch with you? The Substack is the best way to stay in touch on African perspective. I always welcome comments. I'm also on Twitter at K Opalo. Thank you for having me. This was wonderful. As China is rising, African countries uh, becoming less geopolitically naive, as I like to see it. I hope that we can have more of such discussions in order to ensure that, you know, America is able to put its best foot forward as it competes in Africa, which I think it should, like any other country, and that African countries are also able to look at the menu of options and pick the best available option for them. Well, this is great. Well, thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate it. Kobus, what a treat for us to have the chance to speak with Ken. He's a guy that I've been following for years, and I'm just so happy that we had him on the show right now, given all the things that are going on in the relationship at the beginning of this, what everybody's calling a new era in U.S. approach to Africa, and at the same time, this evolution of what the Chinese are doing and something we've been documenting in detail in our coverage. Let's get a different perspective now, and I'm thrilled to be able to welcome back to the show China Global South's francophone editor, who also edits the fascinating website Projet Afrique Chine. And joining us from the beautiful island of Mauritius is Giro Nima. Bonjour, Giro. Bonjour. Good evening to you all, guys. Happy to be back. You were listening in to our discussion with Ken. Before we get into what Kobus thought, I'd like to get your impressions. And I think one of the things that stood out for me 
was that point at the end when I said, Ken is doing God's work in terms of training young American, you know, elite students who are going into the government. That's what Georgetown School of Foreign Service does. It's a feeder school into the U.S. Foreign Service. Tell me what you thought of that and why you thought that might have been important as well. And as you see, Ken is really doing God's work, and God only knows how much we need that nuance in terms of Chinese narrative in Washington. We've been seeing how much it's the debate about China in Washington has been so divisive, it's been so extreme that there's no nuance anymore about what China is doing in Africa, what's really happening. And what really mentioned in his, his answer was really insightful when he says it's time to really bring that light to Washington to help those young students to understand when an African country is going to China to seek for money when he needs to build the railway or to build well because elections are coming why is it happening? What's motivating him to approach China? Those kind of understanding will allow those next diplomats to kind of, when they come to Africa, when they come to raise the China debate in Africa, to have that perspective of understanding that, you know, there is a certain context that they need to take into account to understand why African countries are approaching China the way they're approaching China. And that's really, really important. Without that understanding, without that background, of course, it would always be the narrative that we've been seeing all over this week with different American diplomats being in Africa. So that's kind of problematic for me. So that was my big takeaway of what Ken is doing. Really, that nuanced discourse is really, really needed in the China-Africa debate in Washington. Kobus, we've been hearing all week from the likes of Amaka Anku, who is at Eurasia Group, who we played the sound at the top of the show, who said, listen, Africans have been telling the Americans over and over again, we want a different kind of relationship. Ken himself called for a reset. It seems like it, at least just from the rhetoric, again, it's too early to tell if the substance is going to be there in the policy, but at the rhetorical level, that the message has gotten through, that guys like Judd Devermont in the White House, who runs Africa policy on the National Security Council, he's come up with a very different Africa policy than we've seen in the past few years. At the same time, the Chinese also are changing their engagement strategies in Africa. So we're at this moment right now where both of these great powers are evolving their approach to how they engage different countries on the continent. Give us your take on, again, both of those perspectives. Yeah, it's, it's a great point. Like, you know, I, I think the Chinese and the Africans, I think, are both in different ways learning from roughly about 20 years of intense engagement. Some of that engagement went well, some went disastrously, and they are learning lessons from the disasters, I think, you know, and, and, and pivoting in the process. You know, at, at the same time, as you say, the, there is some re-energization, I think, on, on the US side, and uh, I think a, a more kind of uh, a willingness to focus on some of the priorities that, that Africans have been calling for for a long time, which which are mostly economic, you know, kind of low, mostly kind of around investment, around trade, and you know, and 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 job creation and so on. Um, so that's that's heartening, and and it's great to hear someone like Janet Yellen, you know, kind of saying that, you know, that Africa is the the future, that not just in in the general kind of young Africa, so so dynamic and so vibrant kind of way, but like in the actual future, actual economic future of, of the world. So that's very heartening. What I I feel though is that in a lot of ways is the the US officials don't seem to be learning as much, I think, from this 20 years of Africa-China engagement as the, China, Afri Af the Africans and the Chinese are, in the sense that they seem to be, A, like as we've pointed out many times, many of their talking points remain old, but also that they they don't ever really place the difficulties in the Africa-China relationship in the wider context of Africa's relationships with the world. You know, so so I, I, I wrote a critical column this week for our newsletter in which I, I pointed out that, that the fact that Janet Yellen and um, U.S. Treasury Secretary is only focusing on China's role in the holding back debt negotiations and not on the role of, of the Western private sector whose lending far outstrips that of China into Africa, like, you know, kind of raises questions about how sincere she is about actually solving the problem. You know, like a lot of Africa-China engagement happened because of constraints in Africa's traditional relationships with its Western funders. You know, like a lot of that was a reaction to barriers they faced in the 
pre-China kind of funding landscape. It wasn't because China China was so attractive to begin with. So you know, so so that I f- I feel is is lacking. There is there's there's not enough uh, you know acknowledgement of some of the problems in in the West Africa or U.S. Africa relationship. Some of the barriers. Um, and in that sense, Ken's work is so useful because you know because he puts exactly that that Africa China engagement in the context of what the Africans were dealing with with Western partners before. Well, let's move away from some of the U.S. China Africa issues and look at some other things that have gone on this week. Again, just an incredibly busy week. We got word today that China's ambassador to Kinshasa, to the Democratic Republic of Congo, Zhu Jing, he's going to be moving on. And it's just a normal rotation. Ambassadors come, ambassadors go. But Zhu is very, very interesting because in many ways, and we've said this a number of times on this program and in our analysis, that the DRC today is far and away the most important country in Africa for China because of the cobalt and the minerals and and the importance that has to what China's future in terms of their electric vehicle ambitions, their supply chain security and whatnot. And so Zhu is leaving. And at the same time, he posted some pictures of the beautiful new arts and cultural center that they're building. Again, a transformative piece of infrastructure in downtown Kinshasa. The Stade de Martyr is another one where the rumble in the jungle took place. And so China is going to put its signature in another way on the landscape of Kinshasa. I'd like to get your take, Giraud, given that you are Congolese and you've been following this, on another story as well that you wrote about, which is the possible renegotiation of the 2008 Sikomines deal, the $6.2 billion, what they called back then the deal of the century. So you are very skeptical and suspicious of this. This, of course, was a deal that Zhu was tasked to defend vociferously. He was out there all the time defending the Chinese mining companies in the Congo. Give us your take on Zhu's departure, the new arts and cultural center, and the news from Bloomberg that there is a renegotiation of the, or as some kind of, <laughs> I don't even know what to call it because they were very vague in it, whatever it was, you know, between the Chinese and the Chesakati government. Exactly. But let me first go back a bit and to just make slight correction, because yeah, if, if I don't know that your Congolese people might be coming after you, Rumble in the Jungle did not happen in Stade de Martyr. It happened in another stadium. Oh, yeah. OK. I am glad that you got you. I need to be. Yes, that would have been a, a, a Twitter brutal takedown. Exactly. Of me. So I, I do thank you for uh, I pushed it a little too far yes. on that one. I pushed it a little too far. Yes. But OK. So thank you for the correction. Now, your take on all of the events in Kinshasa this week. So my take, first of all, I think people will say I'm biased because of what I'm about to say. First of all, I think I'm going to miss Ambassador Zhu in Kinshasa for the one simple reason, because him being outspoken Chinese ambassador, he was really giving us a lot to write about. Speaking of the, the rumble in the jungle, this guy had no problem getting out there and throwing punches. I mean, he was, I mean, remember with that, that dust up he had with Peter Pham from the Atlantic Council? And even uh, Ambassador Tibor Naj, he got into it with as well. I mean, he really, uh, he wasn't afraid to mix it up on Twitter. Exactly. So he was really giving us content in that moment where when you talk about China, we don't really always know what Chinese officials think or what they stand on different topics. So him was really out there giving his opinion about what's happening in the country, really have what's happening with the Chinese investment. So he really gave us a lot of elements to work on. And I will even I will even mention the fact that he agreed to be a part of an interview that he gave us about a Chinese relationship with the DRC. So him leaving for me really raised some questions that I even rose uh, in one of the articles I wrote today is the fact that he's living in a moment when US and China are really raising up to that big power rivalry in Africa. In the moment where we see now with the MOU that the US signed with Zambia and DRC about the critical minerals and the electrical battery is in a moment where we see the U.S. trying to move into DRC in the critical battery sectors, is moving at that exact moment when also Chinese companies are really kind of, you know, shaken down with the security in uh, government. That exact moment, the question is, are we going to have the same kind of ambassador after him or Beijing is going to dial down a bit, giving us the kind of ambassador that we used to have, the quiet one, the diplomatic one, or are we going to have a much more offensive one? Because the truth is, him leaving, the question will be like, now, who's going to come after him? Because 
in the U.S. side, we're still waiting who's going to be the next U.S. ambassador. We know who's going to be the next U.S. ambassador. She's been appointed, I think, last month. She still has to take a post in Kinshasa. So, Jujing Living gives us, you know, those kind of questions like what's going to be the Chinese, the one who's going to come, what's going to do. And my take on the new infrastructure that is building, yeah, it's keep on giving this Chinese image of, you know, the Chinese are building stuff. And it's really interesting because that new cultural center is just close to the Palais du Peuple, which is the headquarters of the National Assembly. And that's also close to the Stade des Martyrs. All of them are Chinese built infrastructure. So we are having in that exact place like all all marks of Chinese infrastructure, you know, symbolic, emblematic, you know, building that the Chinese built in Kinshasa. So it's really reinforced that image of Chinese building, you know, the Chinese partner that will come and build infrastructure in the DRC. So the question will be how that image will remain in Congolese mindset. I think it's going to remain for long due to the history and what they keep on doing on the country. But we still remain to see how it's going to happen after that. My last take about the last question that you raised about the situation that's happening with the Sikomin deal with the China Molibedam announcement was made that they are close to an agreement. And I think I wrote it last week when I raised some question about the context in which those negotiations are happening. We know that China Molibedam, one of the company that is in dispute with Jekamin, are still denying the royalty that Jacqueline is asking. How close they are into negotiating and to finding an agreement, it's really hard to say at this point because Sikomin and China Molibedam hasn't commented about the declaration. And when you speak about, when you talk about different people in Kinshasa, they still kind of, the feeling is we are still far away from a clear outcome about the situation. We still don't know what's going to happen. The Chinese are not talking that much because, you know, maybe they're waiting on what's going to happen. We are 2023, it's election year in the DRC. Maybe they're waiting to see if there's going to be a new president in place or a new administration or they're just going to bite time and keep on waiting. On the Sikomin side, the situation has been going on for almost two years. Sikomin has been saying, you know, we're just waiting for the Congolese government to give us the list of infrastructure to build and we're going to build them. They admit that it's still what I think they still owe one three, $1.3 billion in terms, of, or in terms of infrastructure to build. They st- on their side, a few months ago, they say, we're going to wait for the Congolese government to give us a list of infrastructure to build, and we are going to do as much. So since we are in the election time, my suspicion is we are going to see a lot of Chinese infrastructure during this year because it's them building infrastructure is going to help a lot the Congolese uh, President Chisekedi was up for a, a second mandate. Okay, so Kobus, I'm going to give the last word to you on some fascinating new data that came out from Boston University's Global Development Policy Center. They released uh, their latest report on Chinese overseas development finance, and they did it for the years 2020 and 2021. So that's the latest information and the latest dates that we have available for it. What they found was that only 28 new loans were made or new loan commitments were made in that year with a value of $10.5 billion. That is the lowest amount in 13 years since 2008. So that drop off in Chinese overseas development finance, not only in Africa, but around the world that started in 2017, uh, 2016, appears to be continuing. What was your reaction to that data and that trend line from BU GDPC? It seems to me that can be read in two different ways. One is that, this, as you say, this is a continuing of, of a diminishment that we've seen since a, a peak in the mid-2010s. And so, so one, one way to, to think about that is, is well, okay, so, so the, the Chinese, you know, they invested, they hit a peak. At some stage, they realized that this, this, you know, that there are issues with it, and now they're pulling back. And that pulling back is going to continue, you know, and, and approach zero. The other way to look at it, I think, is, is to also point out that, okay, that 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 also coincided with the covid crisis and with you know in in china the covid crisis coincided with this this large scale kind of closing up 
of the country and kind of pulling back from from international engagement for a while. So I think you know it's that that kind of frustrating answer of it's too early to see, <laughs> early to say. But the you, you know I think a, a lot depends on what China's re-engagement with the world is going to look like now. And and you know that re-engagement is slowly starting to gain steam as we seeing you know the need for the Chinese economy to to reach out again to to boost growth and you know and and as we also you know we recently discussed with the journalist the move outwards of Chinese people you know into the world again you know particularly also in response to to high unemployment levels in China so you know so so I think the stage it, it, the the the, the you know, I recently spoke to a China Africa expert who who um, who likened this this COVID lull to to essentially the 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 intermission in a play you know kind of where where the curtains are closed and they're changing the set on on stage and then you know kind of the curtains open open and there's a whole new set. Um, and a whole new situation to look at. I think the curtains are starting to open now, and what what that's going to look like is you know is going to be you know it's, it's it's difficult to say. But at the same time, the the need for China to build international connections, particularly in the global south, and the need for Chinese companies to remain engaged in the economies of the global south, that those two needs are not going away. So um, you know, so so I think I think a lot of the, the China is learning a lot from some of the failures. Of, of the past and particularly as it's now having to deal with all of these massive and complicated debt renegotiation processes coming out of Chinese projects some of which will for the next two decades be used as you know as as sticks to hit China with in terms of kind of bad investments and bad loans like the standard gauge railway you know the, 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 there's going to be a lot of learning but I think that learning doesn't necessarily mean that it's a full on pullback I think what we might see is that the, that it might start creeping up again but maybe in a, in a different form in a different model Okay. Well, if you're with us still this late in the show, then you're probably as obsessed about this topic as we are. And as you can tell, we just love this subject. I mean, we just love it. And you've heard throughout the program references that Giraud, myself, and Cobus have made to the columns that we write in the newsletter. What we're doing in our newsletter and on our website is we're giving you the hot take that same day. So Janet Yellen lands in... Africa on Sunday or Monday, Cobus has got a take for you in the newsletter right away. So you can walk into a meeting and you have some insight on what's going on. Giraud, he responds the same day to the news of what's going on in the DRC on these mining deals. Nobody else is doing that. And that only is, we're only able to do that because we've been obsessed with this topic. And I think that's a fair word, guys. I mean, we're all obsessed with it. Uh, we're obsessed with this topic for more than a decade. We just absolutely love it. And we'd love for you to share in the work that we're doing and the whole team at the China Global South Project. And you can support our work in the journalism that we're doing, independent, nonpartisan. This is the kind of thing that we need in the new chat GPT era in the fake news, misinformation, disinformation era is you need competent human analysis. <laughs> Can you believe, guys, we're talking about human beings now as opposed to kind of machines? So I guess <laughs> that that's where we are, folks. In fact, one of the upcoming assignments that Cobus has is to do a critique of chat GPT's analysis of China, Africa. So Cobus, we need that for next week because a lot of teachers are going to start seeing chat GPT's kind of copy in the term papers start showing up. I am sure the copying and pasting is already started on this topic, but it really Yeah, I have is, to say in, in my reading that I've done so far, the a lot of a lot of chat GPT's kind of writing on China Africa was almost indistinguishable from undergrad writing about China Africa. There you go. And bear in mind Chat GPT is only twenty twenty one data. So version four point of Chat GPT that launches this year will be real time. And that's gonna just turn it on steroids. But you know, guys, me about Chad GTP and the China Africa debate in China Global South debate. For me, the question will be when Chad GPT is going to pick up the element to write those essays and to those texts, from which source is going to take? Is it going to take from those? non-nuanced partisan kind of thing that we've been talking about on it's the show. It's a black box. We don't so know. Exactly. And we might have ourselves, you know, essays written, you know, expressing very certain extremist kind of view. So really, it, gives, right. it gives us really a kind of challenge to think of how we put ourselves out there to be available so people really have to have those nuanced view. Otherwise, it's gonna we're going to have a lot of content that's coming from very extremist view. That's exactly it. And 
and you know, this is why the work that Giro and Cobus are doing is so important. So again, if you'd like to support what we're doing and you'd like to get access to our site, the full archive and transcripts of the podcast, our daily newsletter that comes, just go to chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. If you're a student or a teacher, you can email me, eric at chinaafricaproject.com. I'll send you codes for a discount. Please use your .edu address. Uh, and you can get half off the subscription rate for that. We're thrilled that we have so many students from around the world, including a class this year, this spring, at Amherst College, who is all going to be using our newsletter as part of their teaching uh, materials. So that's really very exciting. So we want to welcome the students at Amherst College in Massachusetts to our global reader community. Let's leave the conversation there. Kobus, myself, and Jay Ho will be back again next week with another episode of the China in Africa podcast for Jiro in Mauritius, Copus in South Africa. I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Tag us on Twitter at China GS Project and visit us at ChinaGlobalSouth.com. If you speak French, check out our full coverage at ProjetAfriqueChine.com and AfriqueChine on Twitter. That's Afrique with a K. And you'll also find links to our sites and social media channels in Arabic. <laughs>